Hey y'all, it is Jeremy from Jeremy.net. I know that I said I was going to try in the future to start scheduling my live streams ahead of time so you people would know when I was going to be on, when it would be a good time for you to, uh, you know, to catch me online while I'm working. But this evening I realized I didn't really have as much time as I thought I was going to in order to create a new video for the channel. Hey, Ian Rocks, how you doing? Sears Studio. Thanks for dropping in, guys. Um, I didn't have as much time to, uh, to create a new video as I thought I was going to, and I didn't really have a topic in mind that I wanted to talk about. And most importantly, I haven't been getting as much work on my comic as I'd like. So I thought, you know what? I gotta practice what I preach. You know, I say most important thing is you just gotta carve out time and do whatever artwork you can in the time you've got. So I said, let's just get on and draw. No topics, no special theme, just me working on a comic. If you guys have questions while I'm working, feel free to jump in. Um, you know, I'll try to keep an eye on the chat as I go. I see Michael Hill popped in. Hey Mike, how you doing? Um, guys, welcome. I'll let you know real briefly what I'm working on and then we'll just roll with it. So I am working on what is the layout for page 17 of issue seven of Morningstar. And this page is a little bit of a mess in the sense that over here on the side of the table, I've got my stack of thumbnails. Now, usually on any given page, like for instance, I'll show you here, the bottom of this, the top half of this page were, uh, were thumbnails for page 16. The bottom half is thumbnails for page 17. And if at any point you can't hear me clearly, let me know in the chat because I'm just using the speaker through my phone. And sometimes if I lean a little bit too far away, cause I tend to move around, move my head a lot as I talk, if I move too far away and the sound starts to drop out or I just get hard to hear, just say, hey, get close to the mic and I'll, uh, I'll try to keep it in check. But anyway, like I was saying, this page, these are supposed to be the thumbnails for the page I'm working on. And just in terms of figuring out the composition of the panels, I've got one, two, three, four, five different compositions I tried to work out here. It's a complex scene that has a lot going on, basically, Things have come to a head between Michael and Lucifer. These archangels who were once best friends are now at each other's throats. And this is the penultimate issue of the series. So things are really starting to blow up. And Michael is fighting through a horde of demons to get to Lucifer. And this whole page is just dramatically kind of conveying all of that. So it's a lot of crowd work and a lot of melee and fists being thrown. And normally... What I, was, what I wanted to show you with this is that this is about how much the thumbnails for a particular page takes up. Sometimes they'll take up like all of a whole page. Like I'll do, work out what, my, what my, I want my composition to be. And then I'll do little smaller thumbnails like these where I'll work out the individual shots, work out the, uh, the details and show what's going on in there. Now, in this particular page, I ended up doing, notice it says page 17A. I've got 17A. Hang on, I have to put a little clip down here to keep my pages from sliding off the drawing table. I've got somewhere in here, I've got 17B and uh, 17 C, D, and E. So I had to go in here and there's like details about just the bottom tier, working out the, the, the pacing and the, the poses that are in there. A page where I work on designs for a particular demon that's in one of the shots. Um, I think a lot of the middle pages were me trying to work out the large largest page in the panel because it's kind of like Michael facing a horde of demons and me trying to just work out the composition. Cause it's kind of sort of a complicated composition. And in fact, 
Yes, that's exactly what it is. So page C is me just trying to work out in simple shapes, what is my focal point and what is my focal point going against? So the white area sort of represents Michael, even though it's a very loose thumbnail of what his page is, but it kind of covers the real estate that he as a figure is facing. And then the large dark mass is sort of like me shape welding. And that's a term I, I took from James Gurney. If you follow his work online, his YouTube channel, or any of his books, he talks about shape welding, which is where you take what could be a very complicated form or a complicated piece of composition. You say, well, what kind of tonal mass does it make? So since he's facing a horde, a mass of demons, this just double triangle like these two mountains represent all of the creatures he's fighting. And then I went inside that and then over the several of the thumbnails, I work out what are the shapes of the creatures he's fighting? Um, how am I composing them within that mass? So there's a lot of that going on. There's an inset shot that's above Michael's head before it goes into this. Um, some details of Michael sort of punching through the head of a demon. Uh, yeah, this is getting crazy. I'm getting a little bit into Luther Strode, uh, Strode territory here, but it, that's a great book, which Iron Rocks, you know, he's the one who gave me that. So you got him to, uh, to thank for that, for that influence. But I had drawn these before I had read that book, but now that I look at this, that's all I can think of. And even this, I can see, remember those thumbnails that I did at the start or that I showed you in the, uh, the very first sheet of thumbnails on page A? Um, so I did like those five thumbnails. I came back in and then I questioned how I wanted to do that. And that's just more of me saying, can I play this out in a different way? Is what I thought the right way? Is that the best answer? And I'm always looking at the page and trying to tweak and refine. So there's four more and actually five more because there's another one up here. So I went through and refined it. And then I got back down to this last one where I realized that the one thing that I had changed in what I thought was the final one was shrinking the middle tier down a little bit. And I realized there's a lot of action going on in this middle tier and I really needed to stretch it back out and make them more equalish. All right, so I see some, uh, some chatter in the chat. Let me uh, roll back through there. Um, American Swordfish, first uh, binder clips are what I have strapped to the, the bottom of my drawing table so that I don't have a, uh, or at least to keep things from not falling as far off the pages I'd like. I'm gonna move my script out of the way so I've got more room for the thumbnails. And I was gonna write my, uh, my Instagram handle down, but I realize I have a card here. This is, uh, these are the cards that I, I give out as handouts at comic conventions. So it's just got my URL and it's got the cover of the trade for Morningstar. On the back, it's got all of my social media handles. So it's got, um, this has been changed to videos.jeremy.net. This is an older postcard. Got to make sure and update that. Then it's got my, uh, my Instagram, which is just Jeremy B. My, uh, my Facebook page, my Twitter, my DeviantArt, my Google+, Tumblr, all that. What I really need to do is learn how to make one of those frames so it has all my social media listed along the bottom of the, uh, the page. Anyway, what I will do, damn it, I'm just gonna just leave this here, but there's too much of a highlight. You see if there's a spot where I can leave it while I talk so that you guys can just check all that out before I dive in. Let's see if I can adjust the lighting so it's not blowing that out. There we go, a little bit better. So, I am working on a very complicated page. A lot of, uh, lot of stuff going on. Oh, I forgot to finish running through the, uh, the chat questions. So, let's see, oh, I see uh, Draw With Rit, Draw With Jer Rich. <laughs> Thank you for, for stopping by. Um, hello, good to have you. Back to American Swordfish. Have, have I seen the Frank Quietly TED Talk on YouTube? I have not seen that. I did not know that he did a TED Talk. Um, as soon as I'm done drawing tonight, I'm going to go online and watch it. 
I have seen a YouTube video called when I think it's called when Frank met Carl or when Carl met Frank and it's Carl with a K and that's a video with uh, a figure drawing to draw with you've seen me mention in my many videos Carl Ganas and I know that he definitely points out a lot of the bad anatomy that comic books in the past have been sometimes notorious for I think in contemporary comic books right now we have some of the best illustrators in terms of anatomy and perspective and doing both realism and doing cartoony work, but I think we have some of the best draftsmanship in comics that we've ever had working right now. That said, in the past, comic books have had a stereotypical kind of bad or wonky anatomy. And sometimes he'll tease that and, and bring up and make fun of it, but he's talking about stuff kind of like Bern Hogarth anatomy where stuff is super flexed and all the muscles are swollen. But the video when, uh, when Frank met Carl, um, Carl Ganas was traveling in Italy, was it early this year or was it last year? I think it was earlier in this year. And while he was abroad teaching, he was part of an exhibition and he also visited, I believe it was um, a gallery in Scotland, in Glasgow. And there was, um, Frank Quietly was also speaking there and I think he had some work showing. So they had, a, they had a chance to talk, look at each other's work and kind of had a little intellectual exchange. And the people who were hosting the events where they were both speaking, sat down and recorded them having a chat about storytelling and anatomy, both from his perspective, working in visual development for film and animation for many years and Frank Quietly's work in comics. And it was just a joy for me to hear an art instructor who's had incredible influence on me having a conversation with one of my favorite comic artists. So that was a real joy to, uh, to hear that. So I will definitely check out Frank Quitely's YouTube video or his Ted talk, but definitely do a search for, uh, for that Met Carl video and trad more. Yes. Something we all aspire to be American swordfish. You're, you're just coming with the great comments here. Um, yeah, he is just a stunning visual storyteller, and there's a lot of things in uh, Luther Strode that reminded me of early Frank Miller work, like Frank Miller's Daredevil run, where you've got characters doing incredibly acrobatic or dynamic work in, in multiple images across one page, where you've got one, you know, you've got one page or one panel, and you've got the character appearing in three or four different places, working through the arc of the actions that are happening in that scene, and it's just incredibly dynamic. So Trad Moore is somebody whose work I was already familiar with, but he's definitely somebody I'm following much closer now. Like his work is just amazing. So on this page now, I'm gonna take this postcard down just because it's gonna be kind of in the way as I flip back and forth through these thumbnails. I'm gonna need to reference all of them. Um, in this page, I tend to these days, I'll start at the end of a page and work backwards. And I'm doing, there's little details that I will work out as I go. And I'd rather the details that be worked out be the final details so I can make sure that what comes before it matches. Now in this case, I'd started to slightly rough in the panel on this side. And I wasn't happy with it. And I just decided instead of continuing to, to beat a dead horse, I just moved over. Now that's something when inking, you try, I try to work in kind of a sequential order to not smear the page, but also in inking, I've, everything is worked out. I'm not really figuring out the storytelling. When it comes to the storytelling, what I try to do is if I'm having problems with a panel, I'll just move to a different part of the page that I'm not having problems with. So what, what's going on here is that the shot that's coming right before this is Michael really in the thick of these hordes of demons punching and swinging. This is the, where the shot of Michael punching through the head of a demon will, will take place. But then he headbutts another one. So we've got a close up. I'll bring it a little bit closer to you instead of moving the camera. So we've got Michael headbutting one demon and then he's punching an angel. You can see, cause he's got the normal human hand. He was holding an ax and then he just punches him like square in the face and the hand just releases the ax. This last shot is gonna be Michael kind of reaching, grasping for Lucifer and Lucifer is up on top of a horse. Um, and he's got his hand moving down towards his, uh, his holster for his gun. So 
these two I feel have what I was going for. Now moving back up to this one, let's take a look. All right, so this right here is panel four. And I'm trying to start with this in a similar way to how I work when I'm doing figure drawings in the sense that I try to start with just the basic, basic form of the figure. Like I always try to start with the torso, Let me see. I need to be careful here because this is complicated. And I'm gonna tell you, this is gonna be a real messy panel because I'm gonna to have to keep shifting things over because there's a lot going on in here. Because I also realized as Michael is punching through this demon's head, he's also grabbing another angel that was in front of him and lifting him over his body. Just sort of like a one-handed wrestling toss. Let me reach for my erasers. There's gonna be a lot of drawing and erasing here. And you know, and I try not to shy away from the messy work of this. Sometimes a page goes smoothly and you know what you're doing and you figure it all out. Sometimes a page is like a mess. Like, you know, a surgeon, an expert in, in anatomy and they're, they're trying to, let's say they're trying to save a patient's life. They've got like a stab wound or a gunshot wound. At the time when they're actually have the patient open on the table, there's blood and guts everywhere and they constantly have to have suction going on to pull guts out of the way so they can see what they're doing. So otherwise they're almost working blind because there's just blood and guts all over the place. And sometimes drawing feels like that where I'm like, wow, I want to get stuff over here, but I can't see this. Uh, I'm trying to figure out where this is supposed to go and I, I can't quite place it. It just, it sometimes it's messy and you're really, that's when your mind might start telling you you're a crappy artist, you're a bad artist, why are you doing this, you suck. And instead of doing that, you just gotta say, look, this is, it's messy and I gotta tame it. Sometimes you roll up your sleeves and you just wade into the, the bloodbath of trying to work out your visual storytelling. Um, a quick question up there. Oh, I see uh, Mario Clemente. Hey, thank you for rolling through uh, and watching the, uh, the stream. Thank you for, for dropping by. Um, the End asked, do I draw comics full time? And hi, good to, good to have you here. No, I do not draw comic books full time. I wish to God I had, I had the opportunity to draw comics full time. Um, my day job is also a creative day job. I am a toy designer. And before you start going like, oh, damn, that's cool than drawing comics. Um, it is a great job. I am very, very lucky to have a creative day job. But first off, when you're working with any major corporation, about 50% of the job tends to be email. So a lot of my job is just emails and meetings. When I am actually designing stuff, I would say only about 10% of job is me, by the way, if my phone just dropped out for a second, if the stream just went weird, it's because my dad just called and I'm recording through my phone. So I had to hang up on him. I had to decline. My dad just got, got the, the diss. So I'll have to give him a call when I, I get off of here. But um, it's crappy. I'm a bad son. Um, but I'm in the middle of a stream. I can't just, you know, drop out on you guys. Uh, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, day job. A lot of the stuff that I design is work where it's already an existing toy. Like we do a lot of children's furniture or inflatable ball pits and playlands. And the actual product, the structure has already been designed by a previous designer. And my job is simply to come in and make it look like whatever brand I'm working on. Let's say I'm working on Spider-Man or I'm working on a Mickey Mouse, I have artwork from their style guide, artwork of their character that's characters that are also drawn by other artists. So I'm not drawing anything either. And I'm doing graphic design work. I'm taking that artwork and, um, and I'll be doing the graphic design of positioning it so it kind of tells a story and creates a sense of like a physical space or a physical object for those characters. And that is a lot of the, the work of my day job. So I'm very lucky to have it, but it is not the same as drawing comics. And the biggest part 
of why I love comics so much is the freedom. Whether you're drawing on your own or if you're collaborating with a, a small team of artists, writers, colorists, an editor, if you're lucky enough to have one, is that whether you're working on your own or with a small team, you're creating this world. And I mean, yes, if you're working with Marvel and DC, it's kind of the same thing where you have to adhere to certain rules with their characters. You can't break their toys. They, but if you bend them in really cool ways, that's awesome. But when you're doing comics, it's your own story. There's way, few, way fewer cooks in the kitchen. And that's not to say that I dislike the feedback that I have, but it's a lot of times, if there's something I do, I may design the coolest toy in the world, but it may be something where, you know, higher ups will look at that and say, well, this doesn't really represent the stuff that we want. It doesn't have features that we want. Or you design something that's really cool, but it's too expensive, we have to simplify it. Sometimes it is the actual licensors, the people like the Marvels, the Disneys, the Nickelodeons, who look at that and say, hey, and they, it's, they, they have every right, because it is their characters and their brands. They have every right to say, you know what, we don't want our characters used in that way, or we'd really like to see you play up this particular aspect of the brand. And sometimes it's a matter of, it's the retailer. Sometimes Walmart or Target will say, hey, we like that, but we want to see this particular character because those are the characters we like, or we just don't like that color. That color doesn't sell well at a, at a retail level for us. So can you make this in cornflower blue? Um, so there's a lot of, um, there's a huge lack of control when you're doing um, creative work for a corporate company. And like I said, I am lucky to have the work and I enjoy it, but my heart and my passion really is with comic books. So the toy company work is what pays the bills for me. And that's the same as like a lot of artists who do freelance work and do comics on their side. I look at having a day job as a do to take freelance work because when you're doing freelance work for clients, it ends up being kind of the same as this, where you have to make a lot of changes to make your client happy, but you also spend probably half of your time chasing your next gig. And because you spend so much time on the, the chasing end, when you actually get around to doing the work, you're usually exhausted, don't have as like to actually do the work, you're rushing to meet hard deadlines. And when I say hard, it's just difficult deadlines. Like it's really short, not enough time. Um, so, I, you know, I, the fact that I have sort of a consistent place where I come in, go every day, do my creative work, um, the people I work with know what to expect from me, I know what they expect in turn, it makes things easy, the situation. And that's not saying I would never work freelance, but there are definitely advantages to being an in-house artist and until I'm at the point where I can produce comics fast enough and I'm making enough money from it that I can, uh, can do it full time. So, yeah, I mean, and it's sad that it comes down to money because I love comics, I love visual storytelling, and it's what I want to be doing. But until I'm making enough money from it that I can afford to not work either in-house or taking freelance work, that's, uh, that's the name of the game. And, um, damn it. Those binder clips, they're not staying put. Something that I have not brought up, like I think I've mentioned Kickstarter recently on the channel, but I'm looking into both Kickstarter and Patreon as new things for, uh, for my YouTube channel. I don't think I've necessarily mentioned YouTube on here. I think it might've been Kickstarter that I mentioned first, but I am definitely thinking about starting a Kickstarter for probably this issue of Morningstar that I'm working on, and as well, starting up a Patreon campaign. So if you guys have thoughts on what you would like to see on Patreon, like what kind of, I'm probably not gonna be able to do physical rewards. And what I'd like to do is keep it something where I'm doing a lot of what I already do, sharing my videos and my works in progress. But at the same time, you know, doing more of it, like maybe creating a more structured program where as opposed to me just working on comics to actually make 
basic lessons on this is how I, I, my process for penciling, this is my process for inking, this is my process for layouts, this is my process for thumbnails. So kind of doing what I'm already doing, but doing it in a more focused way. But beyond that, this channel and this YouTube channel, and as well as the Patreon that I'd start, it's for you guys. So while it's there to help me monetize the time that I spend making this art, I wanna make sure that what I put on that channel is content that you guys feel is worthwhile. So if you guys feel like um, at any point leaving, uh, leaving comments in the, on this video or any of the videos just saying, hey, thoughts on Patreon, I'd like to see this, I'd like to see that. Now, some of them, if there are things that would add too much time to my schedule, and I just wouldn't be able to, to fit it in around my, my work and doing the comics, then I probably will respectfully say that sounds like a great idea, but I might not be able to do it this time. But anything that I can do, if I can fit it into my schedule, and if it's something that enhances the, um, the channel and the, the Patreon that I'll start, I would gladly love to do it, because that's, you know, it's for you guys. You guys are the reason why, without an audience, for an artist to to observe and experience the art that an artist makes, um, you know it it that's a huge. I've missed any comments. Oh yeah, all right. No, everything. I'm I'm pretty up to date on the uh, the comments. I mean on the on the chat. Something that I was thinking about is how many people are viewing this YouTube channel from the standpoint of your comic, you want to make comics as well, and you want, you want information about how I make comics or about the creative process, versus how many people are fans of comics but aren't looking to create? And what do people, because what do people want to see if you aren't an aspiring comic creator? That's the easiest way to sum that up. And I say that because if you're an aspiring comic creator, I have been where you're at. I know what you want, is you want to see the guts. Well, I, that's arrogant to say I know what you want. But what I do mean is I have a good idea in the sense of being where you're at of the kind of things that I like to see in terms of the behind the scenes of other creators. And I feel like knowing what I like to see when I look at the work of other creators gives me a good idea of a good starting point for what kind of content I'd like to create for you. Um, but if you're somebody who is just a comic fan is not interested in comics, I, you know, I, there was definitely a point where I was a comic fan and I wasn't making comics, but I think I've always had my ideas about things I wanted to make. So I was always looking at artwork and comics through that lens, even when I was a little kid. Um, but it'd be interesting to know what are the behind the scenes things that, that people who are just purely fans, just love the medium. And are, you're like, I don't care. I just want you to keep making comics. I'm not trying to make them. I just like seeing what you do. Knowing what people that are comic supporters, comic lovers, comic boosters, comic patrons, what kinds of things you, you would love to see. That's, that is also very helpful to me to, to know that. Um, and, also, because I don't just create comics, you know, I also have the standalone illustrations. I sell my artwork at comic conventions, selling art prints and selling original art that is fantasy and sci-fi related, but not necessarily comic related. So it would also be really helpful for me to know what, uh, what just art fans in general would like to see from a, a Patreon. Um, whether it's having early access to artwork, having early opportunities to purchase works, um, whether it's still just seeing that creative process. But yeah, I see American Sorovich jumping back in there. You enjoy talking about the craft, but also aspiring to create. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of great work just to, in terms of hearing about that engine of pushing yourself forward. You know, unsolicited plug, but I started back in the Patreon for, for Sean Crystal's Ink Pulp Audio podcast. And I had already been a fan of Mark Marin's podcast, the WTF podcast. So when I first heard about um, Sean Crystal's podcast, and he very much cited Marin as an influence for him, like just talking about the same way that Mark Marin gets into comedians and all the ups and downs and the crazy 
life shit that you have to go through and how hard it is and how hard it can be sometimes to just do creative work. Um, one of my favorite shows, and he had started a Patreon campaign. Um, I don't know if it was at the start of this year or at the end of 2017, but I didn't start going, I didn't start um, contributing to his campaign right away. But recently, as I started, you know, getting more and more into Patreon, I hopped in on his. Let's see, uh, Carol Metaphor, free to, to jump in if you guys have any questions. Um, hop in. The chat's real friendly. The chat is warm, like a nice jacuzzi. The chat's warm and bubbly. People are hanging out. Um, and for those who weren't here when I started, uh, I am working on Morningstar, issue seven. Morningstar is a comic book that I'm self-publishing. I'm writing and drawing. It's Lucifer's Fall from Heaven, but it is told as a Western. If you want to see, where is that postcard? This is the cover to the trade of volume one, which is available on Amazon. If you just go to amazon.jeremy.net, you can find it there. But yeah, so I am working on issue seven and we are getting to the end of the series. It's an eight issue series. So I am working on my layouts. And again, for, for people who have not been in my channel before, thank you. Um, I'm glad, uh, glad you like the idea and I hope you do check it out. Oh, I should tell you, I have a link where you can check out, you can download previews at previews.jeremy.net. That's where I have over 60 pages of free comics. There's uh, preview pages of each issue of Morningstar, as well as there's preview pages of my previous graphic novel, Eye of the Gods, which is a psychological thriller. So that's there. Shameless plug out of the way. But, um, oh yeah, the, uh, the comment about aspiring, that's what made me think about, uh, Sean Crystal's podcast, because a lot of the times he gets into very deep personal conversations with established comic creators, um, personal traumas they're going through, family issues, um, health issues, and it's not the idea of being voyeuristic and wanting to see the, the horrors that other people experience. It's about the fact that the life of creatives in general, whether you're a comic creator, a musician, a writer, a poet, whatever, that life for everyone can be difficult. We all have our challenges. And so having to dig deep within yourself and pull out something that hopefully is meaningful to you to the world while navigating the day-to-day -day chaos of life it, it's hard and that's that's a lot of what um like i think that that uh sean crystal's show uh, and it's called ink pulp audio by the way sean crystal's show very much it both celebrates the beauty of that, that drive and that passion to create, that, uh, that aspiring, that uh, American Swordfish brought up, while also allowing us to commiserate over the, dude, I just wanna make cool art. Why is life kicking my ass? Um, and it's hearing other people talk about that, they're getting their ass kicked experience. I think that it makes, I know for me, it makes me feel like, oh, it's not just me. I shouldn't give up. Um, and I think I love comics too much that I ever really feel like I would give up on making it. If there was someone who just guaranteed me, look, there is no way you're ever gonna make a living doing comics, um, I might stop making comic books, but I don't think I would ever, even with my standalone pieces, pencil sharpening brick. Even with my standalone pieces, I feel like I try to create a sense of a story. Like you're, you're walking into a moment and there's, there's more going on in there. I'm always thinking about the storytelling and that, that's the thing. Well, that's what got me into making comics is the fact that I'm fascinated with the storytelling part. Um, let's see, American Swordfish. If I can live my life creating comics, I wouldn't, it wouldn't matter staying poor for the rest of my life. <laughs> 
<laughs> Comics make me rich. You know what? I definitely feel like I, I have a similar view in the sense that I look at the, the act of making these stories and making the art. That has to be the reward that you're after because there's no guarantees in any creative field that you're going to make a profit, that you're going to be rich, that you won't end up broke doing this. So you damn sure better love it. Now, when I talk about profitability and I talk about the business side, one, obviously by the fact that I tell you that I'm not doing it full time, that I have not figured out how to make it profitable. I still have a lot to learn about the business and marketing. Two, for me, the idea of learning how to run a business and learning how to sell my comics, how to make them profitable, to make work that people both enjoy and makes a good living for me. And I'm not worried about being filthy rich. I'm just sort of talking about making a reasonable income, a livable salary. The goal, the reason for pursuing that goal is so that I will have more time to make art. Because as it is, I'll tell you, I am not happy with my comics output. And as Ian Rocks has pointed out, it's because I spend so much time working and reworking stuff. Um, you're right, I do put a crazy amount of work into each page, but that is because as I continue to learn more about art, I see more mistakes. And the urge to make better work just keeps growing. Um, yeah, but the idea of making a living salary, a living wage while making comics and making artwork is that if I can do that, then I can spend more time doing it. Right now, I draw usually one to two hours a day of comic book work. During my work day, what I do is during lunch, I spend my entire lunch break working on my comics, and then I tend to eat while I'm working. Um, it just seems like a more efficient use of my time because the fact of the matter is that I can design with a fork in one hand and a Wacom stylus in the other or my mouse. So I can actually move stuff around. And with graphic design, a lot of it is looking at designs, moving pieces around, thinking about it. So a lot of that work I can kind of do while I'm eating. So lots of people work while they eat. Um, but drawing is not something I can really do while I eat. I could take this hand, leave it aside, and I could have a fork and just be shoveling food in my gullet while I draw, but just trying to do that, just talking about doing that makes me not able to draw. I kind of need my other hand, I don't know why, but for some reason I like to have my, uh, my other hand on the page guiding it. Maybe it's because I move stuff around to get the angles I want, but even when I'm not moving the page, I, uh, I still like having both hands it's like uh, Jim Morrison said, I got my eyes on the road and my hands upon the wheel. You know, that's how I am with my comics. That's how I make my comics. I make my comics door style. Shout out to Ray Manzarek. Um, but, uh, but yeah, if I can make the work more profitable, then hopefully, now true, there's a trap. All of the things that it takes to make, to run a business, take time, and that, will keep me from spending more time making comics. But I'd like to believe that at some point I can find us between the amount of time that I spend making comics, marketing comics, and the profitability of comics. And I can reach a balance where they are profitable, I'm spending time making them enough time, but it's not that the marketing eats up all the time. At some point I'd like to think I'd reach a tipping point where not that they market themselves, because that's never true. Comics, you always have to be selling it. Like even the most established creators, creators you love, they've got to hustle to get their works out there. Um, I'm subscribed to Ed Brubaker's, Ed Brubaker's um, newsletter. The, the guy who writes, um, well his current book, Kill or Be Killed, but you know, Criminal, The Fade Out, um, before that, The Winter Soldier, Captain America, the storyline. Where, he, but anyway, you know, he mentioned that he's got a uh, a new hardcover graphic novel, like a done in one self contained graphic novel called "All My Heroes." My is it my heroes have always been junkies, or all my heroes have been junkies. It's one of the two. 
Point being is that he mentioned on there that because it's a done-in-one graphic novel, it doesn't have the advantage of building up awareness to readers. Where, you know, when another issue comes out and then people find out about it and the word of mouth grows. It's just, this book is out and they have to get orders, retailers to order it. So pre-orders really matter for that book. He's an established creator. He's also working in movies and TV right now. He's developing a TV series with uh, Nicholas Winding Refn, the guy who, uh, who directed Drive. If you saw that movie with um, Ryan Gosling, which is awesome if you have not seen it. Um, point being is that established creators have to hustle. So if they got to hustle, then you damn sure better believe that my ass, my indie comic creating ass over here on the side, you know, needs to hustle the hell out of to get the you know the hell out of it to get my comics in front of people. Um, that was a bit of a tangent, and I lost the thread of where I was going. But the larger point is that making these comics profitable will hopefully be something where even if I spent half of an eight-hour workday marketing and selling my work, four hours out of the day selling my work, and then I had the rest of the day left to draw. Right now, if I'm only drawing one hour a day and then maybe getting in another hour at home on the evenings, and that's not often. Most nights I end up working out, spending all time with my wife, and then doing some of that more marketing stuff, the marketing side of stuff at home, and I don't usually get to draw that much in the week. The weekends really are the times when I'm drawing. But point being is that if I only get to draw one to two hours a day, simply by changing my work, work schedule to where now I get to draw four hours a day and the other half of the time is spent doing art business, that's still quadrupling, quintupling my output. Which means hell, I could probably get up to putting out books on a quarterly basis as opposed to right now where it's more like, you know, one to two issues a year. And hell, if I'm putting out work on a quarterly basis, then I could really start chasing the retail market. Because right now, there are a few retail shops that have carried my work. Um, unfortunately, the now defunct Meltdown Comics in LA, they carried Morningstar. But um, there are a few comic uh, retailers I've met at conventions that were interested in carrying my work. And you know, I've, I've sold comics to them at cost so that, you know, just to get it in their hands, or I've given them, some of them, some retailers, just some promotional copies just to see if their readers like it. But why I don't pursue getting my comics into comic shops right now is because there are a lot of great shops that want to support indie comics. But you gotta do two things. One, you gotta produce a quality work, a quality book that retailers can sell. You can't just give them crap. You've gotta give them quality work. And that's where the, I'm spending hours on pages comes in. But the other thing you gotta do is you gotta publish on some sort of regular schedule. You gotta be able to let them know. If you're only going to publish once a year and you're going to do something like the Hernandez Brothers where you're going to have an annual book, then do that. If you're going to publish quarterly, then publish quarterly. If you're going to do something bi-monthly, publish bi-monthly. But the fact that with my day job right now, and again, I am very lucky to have a creative job. I'm not telling people, hey, I'm, I'm ditching the toy industry or dissing the toy industry. But with the schedule I have right now, there's times when work ramps up and it's really crazy and I can't get a lot of work done or just the idea of keeping myself healthy and making sure that I take time out to exercise and to try and get enough sleep, which I do not right now. Um, making sure I have enough time to get enough sleep on a, uh, on a daily or weekly basis, getting exercise, eating right. Um, having time to, to actually spend with my wife because you got to believe me, if you want to have a healthy life, you need to have a partner that's supportive. And my wife is super supportive, but part of having a supportive spouse means engaging with her. Um, I know a lot of times other creators have joked about their wives being comics widows because they never see their husbands and they're always at the drawing table. My wife is so supportive of how much time I spend putting in with artwork, but I don't want to take that for granted. So I try to make time to do things with her. We go for walks or, you know, she'll go working, go swimming and I'll try to go swimming with her sometimes. Um, 
I try to, you know, we try to have dinner together every night and watch a little bit of TV. TV is a big bane for me because it's a huge time suck. And as most con creators know, TV and games are the enemy. TV and games are the enemy. They are the natural predator of the comic creator. And can I tell you, I'm going to take a pause and I'm going to write that down. Because at some point, I'm going to make some sort of t-shirt or art poster that, uh, that embodies the, the idea of that on television. Yes, they are the natural predators of comic creators or creativity. Let me see. Let me write that down. TV, video, games, comic creators, natural predators. Tour. See, that is how I come up with ideas. I say something and I'm all, huh. And then I try to think now, how do I even make that as a piece? Well, it's simple. I design a creature that's a video game and a creature that's a, a TV and I have them hunting an artist. And I'm, I'm not sure how that's going to take place. But I start with, that's how most of my standalone art pieces come up. Is You literally just watched me come up with the idea for a new art print. Now, the reality is that that's going to sit in my... Uh, in my sketchbook or my notebook for probably like two years until I get around to drawing it. I just had to move away from the table and I had to get my little brush to, so I don't smear the page as I weigh the, uh, the erasure marks. Let's see, I saw a quick comment in the chat and I missed that. Let me uh, run back up here. Oh, a couple of comics. All right, here we go. Ion Rocks jumped in again. Good, I'm glad you're, you're hanging out, man. Um, everyone makes mistakes, bro. Even, re even reality doesn't look right sometimes. That is true. Um, I cannot remember the artist who said it, but there's a famous comic artist, I think probably from the, uh, the 60s or 70s, who said, if it, uh, if it looks right, it is right. Um, I think I might have heard that in uh, Will Eisner's Shop Talk. But, um, but yeah, that, so there's a lot of times when if you draw exactly what you see, it's deceptive or it's confusing to the viewer. And sometimes you have to change it. And that's something I learned in figure drawing class. So that's another good reason to take figure drawing classes. You start learning what are the things that you need to draw as you see them and what are the things that you need to enhance or as animators like to say, what are the things you need to plus? You know, but you definitely need to make changes to, to a lot of things in order to make them look right or to tell the story that you need to tell. Um, I think that's another thing that Alex Toth talked about. If you've ever seen any of his work, I have a great uh, sketchbook called the Alex Toth Doodle Book, which was a collection of writing uh, letters that he sent back and forth between him and another uh, aspiring artist. So, Mario Clemente, can you give me advice to publish a comic on which page you would recommend me? Uh, I'm not sure if I understand exactly what the, the question is, um, are you asking for ideas on how to go about publishing uh, your comic? Are you talking about what platforms to publish it on? Or what, um, like whether to publish on Amazon or Comixology or what kind of printers to use? Um, or are you talking about websites to publish a webcomic on? Let, give me a little clarification on the, uh, the question and I will do my best to answer. Let's see, uh, Drake Tanner. Thanks for, uh, for hanging out in the chat, Jake. Uh, let's see. When it comes to making comics, it's not the artwork that holds me back, but thinking about the story. Well, that is true. Thinking about the story, the story is the hard part because it takes a long time to draw a comic, and you don't want to sit there and draw something that, uh, that sucks, that, um, that really is, you know, if you're going to spend hours, days, weeks, months writing a story, you want to care about it. Because if you don't care about it, your audience isn't going to care about it. And if you don't care about it, you're going to get halfway through and you're going to be like, oh, this, this isn't good. I'm going to give up. I'm going to show you something. And I'll tell you what, because you guys are the, 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 the largest audience I have on social media is my YouTube channel. I'll give you guys a of something that's going to be 
part of the lessons that I'm gonna put on my Patreon. So you guys are getting a, a pre-Patreon exclusive. So when I do launch that Patreon, hopefully you guys will wanna check it out because this is the kind of stuff I'm gonna try and provide. Um, first, let me grab a little The reason why I want to show you a quick sketch first is because I want to show you my approach to writing. Actually, what I want to show you is my approach to outlining. I have a YouTube video, and it's just called How I, How I Write Comics from Start to Finish. It's not called How to Write Comics from Start to Finish because everyone has a different feel. You might take a little bit from Stephen King. You might take a little bit from uh, Joyce Carol Oates. You know, just pull from all sorts of people and, and learn in terms of learning how to your craft because no one can tell your story but you. So my method of writing comes from the fact that I am an artist. I've spent most of my life drawing. And as I got out of college and I realized that I still, I learned a lot about creativity but I didn't necessarily learn as much about draftsmanship as one would hope. I started, you know, going to figure drawing classes and I started like hanging out with animators because animators need to know how to revolve things in three-dimensional space. They can't just draw something from one side. They need to be able to imagine how a hand looks from the top, from the side, from the back. They need to be able to imagine what this finger is going to look like as it bends in. You know, that, that they need to understand structure, volume, and anatomy. So hang out. And, and animators saved my life artistically. But... My approach to writing comes from my approach to drawing. I realized I'd spent most of my life learning how to draw, and when I started getting serious about I realized, wow, I really need to up my game on writing. I need to study it more. And when I started studying the craft, I realized that figure drawing gave me a framework for how I approach anything I have to learn. Any new task, whether it's a writing task, a drawing task, a technical task, I realized that there is an overall structure to all things. There's an overall logic to it. And it's usually your gesture. Let's say you've got a character and they're kneeling. You might start with their torso and the leg going back, and then you might have another gesture for the leg, com the leg coming down. Um, then you might say, all right, well, where's the, uh, the shoulders? You might decide, I'm gonna have both hands on the shoulder. Let's put a little width there. Let's say that in order to not have it be narrow, you might actually want to have the shoulder turned away a little bit. So the upper torso is turned away a little. You have to put this shoulder down, put this one up so you get the difference of them. Then you say, well, the neck is going to be in between and the head is going to be on top of that. You need to put out, flesh out the pelvis so it's not just legs. Your foot is flattened against the ground with the heel coming up. So that's a quick little gesture drawing. But let's say I do this drawing and I'm like, uh, you know what? I want this arm to be up. So you move the piece around. Maybe you erase this hand. Maybe you decide instead of having them kneeling on one leg, maybe you erase that and you decide to put both legs down and they're kneeling like sort of a Catholic church kneel. Now, it's starting to get a little bit messy here, but how does this relate to writing? Well, I am a big believer in outlining. There are two types of writers. There are plotters and pantsers. Plotters are people who work on, like I said, the plot. You need to understand where the character's going. You write outlines, some loose, some detailed, but you figure out the story structure See, even with drawing this, I'm all, that foot's out too far. It shouldn't go any much farther than back here. I looked at that and Bob portraits were so horrible. That's how crazy I am. Um, even when I'm drawing this, that's a problem with drawing while I'm talking. Um, the drawings get a little wonky. All right. Um, yes. Plotting versus, uh, versus pantsing. Pantsing is writing by the seat of your pants. It's exactly what it, what it sounds like. Scene one. It was a dark and stormy night. Character opens the door. Who's behind the door? I don't know. Um, you just make it up as you go along. And then when you get to the end of the story, the idea of, of writing by the seat of your pants is that if you don't know what's coming next, your reader won't either. You'll surprise yourself. Now, writing as a pantser can be a lot funner because a lot of people 
feel like once this the every the, the outline is done, so sort of wrote flat blah 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 blah, and they don't enjoy it. Um, now writing with by the seat of your pants means there's usually a lot of rewriting. So you'll write yourself into blind alleys, you'll have to back up, change things, or you'll write all the way to the end and then say, all right, I need to go back and rewrite and add these characters, remove these, char remove this character, put in this plot point, add this thing, I need to foreshadow this. So there's a lot of stuff that goes in afterwards. I believe that one process is better than the other. However, I have tried to write by the seat of my pants on multiple occasions, and I have failed. Um, I tried to do it with Morningstar to some degree. I, my outline, I outlined all eight issues, but it was very loose. I didn't go into detail. What I tried to do was write a paragraph on each issue, on the events that happened, and then I would go in and write a more detailed page-by-page -page breakdown for each issue as I went. I got halfway through to issue four, and then I realized that I had a lot of structural problems that I hadn't figured out, and I decided I need to go back and rewrite and write detailed outlines for the last four issues before I drew them. And that's, I went through the same thing with my first graphic novel, Eye of the Gods, where I had drawn, written and drawn the first issue, what was the first issue, even though I published it as a self-contained book. Then I moved on to the next issue and the next issue. And, but when I went on, I realized, when I went on to move on to the second issue, there were a lot of things I hadn't worked out and I had to go back and do what I did with Morningstar. So I am, I am a plotter. I need plot, I need structure. That does not mean that I think writing by the seat of your pants is bad. And it does not mean that I will never try it again. I believe that you always need to mix up your creative process and try things. Who knows, in a decade, I might be writing a book about how to write by the seat of your pants. But right now, my process is about outlining and how I believe in outlining and it gives me a st strong sense of structure. And how does that tie back into figure drawing? Well, before you work on, this is just a loose scribbly stick figure. Once you have a loose scribbly stick figure, then you say, all right, what is the actual defining shape of the, you know what, just to make this a little bit clearer, I'm gonna switch to a marker. My little buddy Sharpie. Once you've got that loose scribbly figure, then you'll say, all right, this is the defining shape of the rib cage. Here is the opening for the neck. Here is the line that runs down the middle, the linea alba. Here's the split at the bottom of the rib cage. Here are the tops of the pelvis. And I'm not going to get into drawing the bones of the pelvis. I'm just going to draw it more like a, the simple shape that we see. But here's the, the torso stretching down. Here is the basic volume, the cylinders that make up the, the upper leg. Well, actually, now that I moved it here, I can move the ankle back there. Here's a cylinder that makes up the lower leg. Here's a cylinder making up the upper arm. Forearm, the egg shape of the head, the cylinder of the neck. Now, uh, let me just draw the shoulder there. Now, I'm not going to go in and draw the rest of that figure, but my point is this. This isn't even anatomy yet. This is just volume. The anatomy would be, I'll bring this closer so you can see it. Like these, this is the simple little figure that I just drew. Now, Anatomy is deltoid muscle, pec muscles, bicep, triceps on the back, the muscles of the forearm, adding the, the point of the elbow because that's a visual landmark. the lat muscles coming up, the lat muscles on this other arm. If I were to have this arm over on the side, coming out this way, you'd see the lats going out and then down into the, the back, coming up the side and the back. 
the serratus muscles, the obliques on the side, the ab muscle. Now these are very bloopy, poor versions of anatomy drawings, but as you can see from what I did before, there's detail in there that wasn't there before. This is what my writing process is. I start with the very simple, what happens to the character, then what happens, then what happens. Almost like writing by the seat of your pants, but for the whole loose structure of the story. If you were to just say, like if you were to tell a friend, oh, I just saw Avengers Infinity. Well, Avengers Infinity War is a bad example because that movie's complicated as shit. But let's say you just saw Incredibles 2. You were just supposed to say, oh yeah, there's this family of superheroes. They had a previous um, movie where the, they got revealed to the world that they're still alive as superheroes, and now they're trying to make superheroes legal again because they've been outlawed. And you just go in to, and then this happens, and then this happens. They decide they want the, the wife to be the main hero now instead of the husband, and the husband is staying home and taking care of the kids. If you were to sit down with a friend and just tell them, hey, I just saw this movie. This is what happened with it. That's sort of your outline. Then you go in and you add in the actuals of, well, this is what happens page by page in terms of the actual events that, that make that up. That's what the volumes are. The anatomy is the dialogue, the foreshadowing, the mood, the description of things like smells and tastes and scents, you know, describing all the things that, that the, the nuance that makes this world feel lived in, whether it's prose or comics. Um, yes. Uh, that's a uh, madness. Jack jumped in. It's like uh, Drake Tanner. Be more creative. Stop social media. Do you guys know each other? Are you trolling your friend? <laughs> I hope so. Um, I don't. I don't like to. You know, just just beat people down. I do like to encourage people to be creative, but um, but the idea for working out a story is that uh, <laughs> okay? Madness, Jack. You just wild out. All right. Cool. All right. Well. Get, get in here. I've, it's, we'll, we'll while out together. But um, I, I see it. You're coming with the tough love for, for creatives. I, I can respect that. Um, sometimes someone does need to tell you to put down the Twitter and make some damn comics. I've, I've been told that before. So, uh, but, um, but back to what you're saying, uh, Drake Tanner, about thinking about the story is you notice when I first started drawing this, uh, this rough thumbnail is that I move pieces around and it's loose and it's rough and it's not perfect. It's okay to not have the perfect story, but what you need is you need something on paper so you can start molding and shaping this. Um, it is very difficult to make something brilliant out of thin air, but what you can do is you can take something that's crappy. Like I can take a crappy sketch and I can fix it. I can look at the crappy sketch and I can look at the mirror reflection of it and I can figure out, oh, it needs this. The anatomy's wrong here. I need to do research on this particular joint because I don't know how it looks. You can do things to fix a bad drawing. And that's true of writing. If you have a story and you're having trouble with it, write the bad version of that story. Write the bad version all the way till the end. Write the bad, write all of the scenes of the, write the story structure of the bad version. Then try to fix that structure and say, all right, well, what would make this better? What would make this surprising? What would make this not have tropes and not feel like something that I've seen before? How can I surprise the audience and surprise myself? And you fix that at the loose basic story stage. You make it the best that you can. Then you go in and you actually add the scenes, the actual story structure, the, the, the plot devices and the, the different moments. Add that part and you try to make that as best as you can. But when you make it, it's not going to be perfect. It's okay. Go back and then revise those and fix those. And then when you actually add your dialogue, you write your dialogue. You don't just write it once. I'm talking, talking like Scooby-Doo. Hang on. Let me take a drink of water. I'm getting a little dry mouth here. <laughs> yeah. So you don't just write a story once. You don't just write your dialogue once. Even for me, when I tend to write dialogue... What I do is I write my, well, hell, uh, let me pull it over and show you. For instance, this is 
my uh, I've got a stack of my uh, my outline for all of Morning Star. This is literally the whole series. Or actually, no, it's not because I think I take out the uh, the earlier issues when I get to the ends. So this is just I think. What is this? This is just five through eight. So this is the second half of Morning Star. Um, when I write my outline, I try to just write one sentence for a panel. One thing happens. If I think of a line of dialogue, I write it down. If I don't, I don't press it or force it. I just make sure I know what happens. But usually I will write, you know, dialogue and what the shot is. Sometimes I've got some where it's just, I don't have any dialogue. I will just say Raphael pulls Lucifer's arm and I may not have anything else in there. I may just have that. Um, but once I'm done writing that, uh, you guys are so tired of hearing binder clips hit the ground. I know it. Uh, once I'm done with that, I go and I draw this big stack of thumbnails. When I do the thumb, if I come up with a new piece of dialogue, I will write it in. And frequently I do because I'm spending time looking at my script. So look at my, well, my outline. I look at that as my first, my outline is my first pass of dialogue. I look at the thumbnails as another pass. And if I think of an, a cool line for something or a different take on it or something that adds some more nuance or depth, I'll write that down in my notes. Once I'm done with these thumbnails, I actually letter the comic book. The, um... I'm still here, just looking. Just looking, you're right back. Uh... Okay, so when I letter my comics, what I do is this is very faint because I draw on top of this. The dialogue is printed on vellum. But basically what I do is I create the boxes in Illustrator at the size that they'll be for the final comic. And I, I put in rough placement word balloons with the dialogue that I've done for emails. And I do that for each page of the issue. And when I'm doing this, when I'm lettering these, these templates, and just to be clear, what I'm saying is I will take, I realize I didn't describe it as clearly as I should have. These little diagrams I have of how the page is laid out are what I draw and I add the dialogue from my thumbnail, my outline. Now they're putting the tails to the word balloons because I'm gonna probably move this word word balloon placement around when I'm done or where I position the character will decide where their mouth is going to be. So that will change. But then basically as I'm doing this, I'm rewriting the dialogue. A lot of the dialogue gets rewritten in this stage. Here's what the phase that we're at now in this, this is the phase where I'm actually just drawing the figures in around the dialogue. When I get done with this, as I do this phase, every time I look at the page and I look at the dialogue, I sort of reread it and ask myself, can I make this better? And if I think of good lines, I jot them down. So I'm slowly, gradually making each portion, each process of the comics better as I go. I'm trying to make gradual improvements. Um, and that comes back to the idea of having trouble with story. It's very hard to make a great story out of thin air, out of nothing. For me, the process is do the bad version. Um, screenwriters talk about it all the time. They call it a vomit, where you just vomit the story out. You just get all of the things you want to say out on the page, and it's a bloody mess, and it's god-awful, and you would never show it to anybody. But maybe you do make your vomit draft, and you show it to someone for feedback, and you know that it's a horrible mess. It's not something that you would have a reader, like someone you're trying to, you know, share your comics with. It's not necessarily something you would give to a um, It's not necessarily something you would share if you're looking to get published by, by someone else instead of self-publishing. But you may show the vomit draft to someone for feedback. Or you may just sit down and look at it yourself and say, all right, what is everything I hate about this story? And then just take out all the things you hate and replace it with stuff that's cooler. And then maybe you do that process a few times. Maybe like some writers, you have to put that in a drawer or close the file and not look at it for a couple of weeks and then come back and look at it with fresh eyes. But what stops, I think, what I believe stops a lot of creative people from starting art projects, whether they're writing, music, whatever, 
is the idea that, well, I can't make it as good as I want. I can't make it perfect. I can't make the beautiful thing I see in my head. Everything we see in our head is perfect. And everything that comes out on the page is not. But you start bringing it out into the world. You have to start with that imperfect thing and then try and push it and mold it closer to the beautiful thing that you do see. And sometimes magic happens. Sometimes you're able to get that beautiful thing right out of your head. Sometimes you have to claw and scratch to get there and it takes a long time. Sometimes you have to let go of the beautiful thing in your head because you're making something on the page that's equally beautiful. It just isn't what you imagined. And if you keep trying to force it to be the thing that you want it to be, you're going to staff your own creativity. You're going to kill something beautiful. That's a gift to you. You know, that's what a happy accident is. It's a gift. We didn't plan to make that thing, but yet it happens. And which one do you know? Do, um, which one is your piece going to be? You don't know. It's different for me every time. For me, sometimes it's the beautiful thing. Sometimes it's the cr scrappy thing. Sometimes it's me discovering something that wasn't what I intended, and I just got to let it be this new thing. It's, it's different every time. Um, so you have to be open to that. And hopefully, I know for me, the longer I make comics and the longer I make artwork, the better I get at figuring out which one it is and the faster I figure it out, um, which does make the process go faster. But don't be afraid of that messy, I don't know what this is or I don't like this stage. That, that's the place where negativity hurts you. That's a place where it stifles you. You, can, you have to, to dive into pieces and just wade in. Just wade in up to your, the blood and guts and get up into your armpits and, and, and get in over your head. Get in over your head creatively and then see like, all right, this piece is a mess. Instead of just throwing it away, say, all right, how can I save it? Or this piece is a mess. Let me start from scratch but make it better. Let me see what I can do to those, uh, those mistakes I made. So I'm going to run back up real quick through the, the chat because I see you guys, you've, you've still been good fit, man. All right, come on, come on. All right, are we back? All right, it froze for a second. Sorry about that. Um, I don't know. The internet is imperfect. The internet is trying to make stuff as good as possible. I was freaked out for a minute. All right, so... American Swordfish. There we go. Something that helps me with the plot is thinking, is that what I want to read in a comic? Are you reading the things that you, um, that I enjoy reading and watching? Yes. That's, that's a great thing. I think the same thing too. You know, um, Drake Tanner, this is actually a magical thing because I've been wanting to, what's happening here right now is what I always dreamed of which is where I'm hanging out online and I'm working and I'm talking to people. But at a certain point, you guys are actually talking to each other. The fact that you're kind of sharing, everyone else is also sharing their thoughts and their ideas about creativity. It's almost like me being here is secondary. It's like, eh, I give you something to look at and listen to while I'm working. But you guys actually communicating with each other. Um, something that I've always admired and a lot of other artists that I follow, like... Um, like the One Fantastic Week um, YouTube channel. They have an amazing community they've built online. And the idea of looking at creative people, building communities of other creatives that are helping and sharing and engaging with each other. I mean, yeah, this is just us on a YouTube channel talking. It's not like we're banding together to have some sort of comics rally on Washington. But just the fact of having a group of people sitting here talking, sharing ideas and thoughts about creativity this is something that I always dreamed of and hoped of, um, hoped for. So just seeing the start of that happening here is a really cool thing. Um, but yes, an American Swordfish, you are very right. Sometimes you just have to break the rules. Madness Jack also says, I read a lot of comics. Honestly, the best thing to see is a plot twist or a bank robbery. You know, that's, I, I, I agree. I, I, the thing I love in, in stories is when they lead you in one direction and then turn you in another. Like, let's say you think you're going into a bank robbery and you go into a vault and you walk in and either the vault is already empty or you walk into the vault and 
um, someone's already there waiting for you and it's bad. It's somebody who you, re it's the worst person that you would want to see. Um, I can't remember if it's Blake Snyder with his Save the Cat or whether it was Billy Wilder, but some famous um, screenwriter or filmmaker once said that screenwriting is, oh no, I think it was William Goldman. William Goldman, I think, said, um, screenwriting is taking your character, sticking up in a tree, and then throwing rocks at them for 90 minutes. What I like to say in any given story, whenever I'm having trouble figuring out what to do, I ask, well, what is the worst possible thing that could happen? And then have that happen. Because then what gets interesting is the stakes rise. The character has to figure out how to deal with this crappy scenario and this crappy situation. And having scenes constantly escalate in their crappiness, having things constantly getting more challenging, that's, uh, that makes for great storytelling. That's for, that makes for great drama. So, yeah, putting in the, the, the plot twist, the surprise, the upping the stakes. Yeah, just keep throwing your character in the deep end and having them have to figure out how to get out. I was hanging out with uh, my buddy Carl Altstetter earlier this week, comics legend Carl Altstetter, and I was working on the page before this one, and we were sitting around, like, we, we're having dinner, but we like to hang out and draw, so we, we ate, and then the, just broke out our, our art stuff, and, and we're just, just drawing, doodling, sketching. I was working on the page before this one, and at a certain point, I was just looking at my page, and I'm just like, damn it. 50% of this job is just killing tangents. <laughs> I realized when I put this arm right where I wanted it, it made the, um, the top of the knuckles line up with this. You probably can't see it well. But yeah, this... Um, if I drew the arm the way that I originally positioned it, the knuckles tangent, they'll line up with the bottom of this word below, of this uh, caption box. So I would need to either put the arm so that it's cutting across that or coming behind it, or just move it over. Like as it is, the fingers are gonna cut around it, but I'm still figuring out where I wanna place that hand. The challenge is you have an overall idea of a composition, and yet you need to keep moving stuff around and changing stuff. Um, let's see, Grant Morrison, I see, uh, no, Grant Morrison isn't in the chat. Uh, American Swordfish said, Grant Morrison is a great writer. He never repeats himself at the risk of doing something very ridiculous. Yes, he does a lot of ridiculous comics, but I love his work. And you just reminded me about making sure I look up Frank Quitely's TED Talk. Um, you guys are really helpful. Did I, did, you know what? I, I know that I appreciate having people actually listen to me and people that are interested in my comics. Um, but... I get a lot of helpful comments on, on the YouTube channel. Sometimes you suggest particular techniques or processes that I haven't tried before, and some of them might not fit for me, but some of them are like, oh, that's a good idea. I should definitely check that out. And just recommendations of different creators to check out, like a TED Talk with, uh, with Frank Quitely, which I would gladly watch. Uh, you guys are really awesome, and I want to make sure that I express that to you as a group of people that are taking the time out of your day to experience the creative work that I'm putting out there and spending time with me that I appreciate that, but I appreciate you guys. You're a very, very cool group of subscribers, of viewers, and I feel honored to have, to be a part of this creative community. So thank you. Thank you for being here. I'm getting all like choked up and like Tom Hanks on this motherfucker. You know, I still haven't read the um, the Grant Morrison book, Super Gods. I need to check and see if it's available on Audible because a lot of prose books, for those of you who don't know, um, Grant Morrison wrote this book called Super Gods. It's sort of like his book-length essay on the nature of superheroes and creativity and mythology and magic. And I think the magic part, everything he writes has an element of magic in it. Um, I haven't read it yet, but it's become highly recommended to me. 
these days, most of the stuff I read, I am actually listening to audiobooks because the same way that you, some people have told me that they listen to my channel while they're working. I like to listen to audiobooks while at work. So um, I've been doing that a lot. And I think that, uh, you know, the, the time that I have for reading prose books, there's very few that I'm, I'm able to carve out time for. Um, Grant Morrison's is one that I want to read. But that said, if it's an audiobook, that makes it much easier. The only problem is, I don't know, if there is an audiobook, if it's written by Grant Morrison, I may not be able to understand any of it. <laughs> That said, Grant Morrison is awesome. You know what was interesting that I saw the other day? Um, I subscribed to um, Scott Snyder's YouTube channel because I saw he had some, some, uh, some videos on there where he was talking about his writing process. And he just recently started the channel. It's pretty new. Um, he doesn't have that many videos up. But along with ones where he's at home at his desk talking about comics and creativity in his process, he just had one from uh, this year's San Diego Comic-Con. And there's an experience where they built sort of like the lair from the Court of Owls. And he was talking about how he went there and it's all, it's like a little mini haunted house. But even though he created those characters, there was still stuff in there where they had jump scares that, that kept uh, getting him. And, but... You know, he just went in and just afterwards when he walked out was just telling everyone how awesome it was and how much he loved it and how great it was. And you could tell that he really appreciated that and just never thought that he would have an experience like that. I enjoyed watching a comic creator have a life-changing experience. I'm not saying that that moment in itself was life-changing, but the idea of creating a comic and then having that comic be so successful, pencil sharpening. And then to have people actually build a physical entertainment experience around a story that he wrote. Like, I know that I, just watching, you could tell how much he was like blown away by that experience. And he expressed it in the video. Um, but to watch someone get to experience that, that gave me a huge sense of joy because there's not enough joy in the world. There really isn't. But to see another creative person achieve, it's not the level of success. It's the, the level of having people be that passionate about what he made that DC Comics would make an experience, a, a, you know, a physical walkthrough experience based on one of his comics that was just super cool so i don't know if um because again i've only kind of dipped in i've only watched a few of scott snyder's videos so i don't know how deeply they all of them go into the writing process whether it's really educational stuff or just him sort of talking about his day-to-day -day work life at dc comics but that said he seems like a really cool guy um, and that video of him walking through uh, the Court of Owls haunted house was pretty cool. Just getting a chance for a creator to get to see that experience. All right. So we are getting up to 85 minutes on the chat. I was going to stay on for an hour and a half, which will be 90 a little bit. And I'm going to pretty much wrap it up in five minutes. If you guys have any last minute questions, please feel free to jump in and ask and I will uh, do my best. And if not, then we'll, uh, we'll start winding things down here. You know, while I have you guys here watching, how much of a difference is it for you as a viewer with the, um, with the videos, the time-lapse videos where I'm talking about specific topics versus just having me here uh, live streaming and chatting, how much, which one do you enjoy more? Or if you enjoy them both, how are the experiences different for you? Because I enjoy doing those, uh, those videos, 
the the ones where I sit and I sort of like, you know, where I talk about my work while it's time lapsed. But the fact that I kind of have to think up a topic before I do each one does require a little bit of brain power and talking extemporaneously, talking off the top of my head is harder when I don't actually have an audience. Like one of my friends pointed out to me that he's like, why are your videos not funnier? Because I crack all kinds of jokes in real life. I'm kind of silly and ridiculous. And, um, and you know, I, I like to cut up. But when I'm sitting there and I guess, I don't want to say lecturing, but when I'm talking on the, the, my YouTube videos, I'm kind of concentrating on what I'm trying to communicate and I'm not so much thinking about being a wise ass. So they're not as entertaining. But when I'm just sitting here talking with you, I feel like I'm a little bit more relaxed. It's not, I'm not shy about being in front of people that I don't necessarily see in person. It's more sort of like you guys ask questions and I, uh, well, to bite Gary Vaynerchuk, you guys ask questions and I try to answer them. <laughs> um, Gary Vee's a, a business guy. Um, I don't want to say guru. He's a, a, a promotion, marketing, and uh, business mogul. Um, but he's a guy that anyone who is interested in entrepreneurship ends up looking up at some point. And he has a lot of... Point being that th this is easier for me to just turn on the camera, draw, and then just answer questions as you ask them. But it doesn't mean I'm gonna stop doing the, the videos, the time-lapse videos. That said, if you guys are like, dude, by far we like the time-lapse videos 100 times more than videos where you're going over uh, topics, the, the kind of lesson-y, tutorial -y ones, if you guys prefer this way more, then I might start making the channel like maybe three, maybe half the videos will always be live streamed, or maybe I might even do like two thirds live stream and the, uh, the ones that are more essay time-lapse videos may only be once a month. So guys think about that, what you like, what you don't like. And again, if, if the answer is you like them both equally for different reasons, that doesn't mean I have to change anything, but it's important for me to know what you guys enjoy. So, because that way I can make better videos for you. So, I see Iron Rocks, you, you do like uh, the live videos. Well, good, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. What would suck is if I'm literally on here right now and everyone's all, dude, get off the live. Start, start, go back to time lapse. Take your sorry ass back to time lapse. See, I wouldn't make that joke in the, the time lapse video. In fact, that's a thing that I probably, I mean, to intentionally try to be funny, but remembering that I'm just here talking to you, I can kind of like bounce off of you guys a little bit and off of your energy and I can be a little bit more playful. And that's something I think I'm starting to learn just from doing the live streams. Cause I definitely felt like I was a little bit stiffer when I first started doing these. Um, in terms of how I spoke. And honestly, the drawings are still a little bit stiffer because it is hard to draw. That's actually the one thing I was gonna mention. One of the reasons why I stick to the, um, the, the time-lapse videos is because it is harder to draw while I talk. Obviously, I'm doing it, you're watching me do it. And you're like, all right, he's hanging in there. But I end up erasing a lot more and I put down a lot more lines and it's hard for me to remind myself I told myself mentally, I'm all, oh, remember to draw lightly. That way I can kind of move stuff around. And I completely forgot about that. I just went back in here and like hard lined this stuff. Like these lines are a lot darker than the light lines over here, the light lines of this figure in the back. And I try when I'm first blocking a, pa a panel or a page in, I tell myself to just draw that because it gives me more space to move things around. And the page ends up being a little bit less messy. But that's the downside is that I can't, when I do the time-lapse videos, I'm drawing first and recording them and then I come back and I speak about what I drew later on or I speak about whatever topic. I, so when I'm drawing, I'm just focused on the drawing. I'm trying to make each line the best line I can and make it focused on what I'm trying to say and express. Um, and that's much harder to do while I'm live streaming. But the more that I've been doing it, 
the longer I'm talking to you guys, the I think I'm getting better at um, the cast being able to be here and you know talk a little bit more, draw a little bit more, hang out a little bit more, be a little bit more of myself. So they talk about when you're doing social media, like when you're creating content for social media, about being authentic. And I think that it is hard for me to just say, like to be, to say exactly what comes to mind because there is a little bit of a filter where I'm like, wait a minute, should I say that shit? Because sometimes I say outlandish shit in real life. I can be a little crazy. And I'm sure you guys would be like, well, dude, be, go buck wild, wild out. But I try to keep it reasonable. I try to keep it something where I'm not being ridiculous just for ridiculousness sake. Like it would be me trying to show off and try to make it a comedy show. Whereas being entertaining just by virtue of my natural thoughts and inclinations, that feels like the real me. And I think that I'm slowly getting there with you. So I don't know if you guys notice that or if you guys feel like I'm kind of mellowing out or opening up a little bit more in the live streams, but this particular night, I don't know what it is about it, but I feel like I'm getting there a little bit more. So that's, that's good. I'm, I'm happy for that. All right. So American Swordfish, you, you enjoy both with the live streams and with live streams, you have the plus of discussing any topic. So there's, there's good, good and bad for, well, not good and bad, but there's good to both. So we shall carry forward with that. But for now, Thank you, everybody that joined, that, uh, that joined in the chat. Thank you to everybody that took the time to view. Um, please uh, hit that like button. If you're checking me out for the first time, subscribe to my videos. I try to do live streams once or twice a month. The rest of the time, I do time-lapse uh, videos. Um, also, I, uh, earlier, I busted out my little social media card. Where is that? the postcard that I have from conventions. So I put, busted that, busted that out earlier, just watching now. You know, I've got a newsletter, weekly newsletter, where I can keep you up to date on all of my events, conventions, new artwork I have coming out. You can download free previews of my comics. Um, it's my Tumblr, it's my YouTube channel, and it's actually, I need to change this because it, this will take you to my YouTube, but I create a custom URL. It's just videos.jeremy.net. Got my Instagram, my Facebook, the Twitters, the DeviantArt, still rocking DA, my Google Plus. I know people are like, is anyone even on Google Plus? I interact with people on Google Plus. It's still there. I keep posting. I just, it, uh. Anyway, thank you guys. And 